please welcome the Chief Executive Officer, IAB, Randall Rothenberg. Yeah, you know, today's consumers can seem very complicated. On the one hand, they love to receive customized, even personalized communications. 81% of consumers want brands to get to know them well enough to know when to approach them and when not. 80% of consumers say they're more likely to do business with a company if it offers personalized experiences. 75% of consumers want retailers to offer them products and services based on their past purchase history. And 52% will switch brands if the brand doesn't personalize communications to them. On the other hand, consumers are worried about what they perceive as the cavalier ways their data is used and misused in digital environments. 73% of consumers say their concerns over data privacy are growing. Two-thirds of consumers say they've taken steps to secure their data. And of those, three-quarters have changed their privacy settings, more than half have deleted mobile apps that worry them, and a third have changed their social media consumption habits. Only a quarter of all consumers believe companies are handling their data responsibly. And there you have the entire history of the commercial internet, from its inception in 1994 with the release of the first AT&T banner ad on Hotwired, all the way until today, 26 years later. The redemption and the fear, the kiss and the punch, the joy and the oy. Each and every person in this room lives with these seeming contradictions every day in your personal lives if not in your business lives. You love the way the internet gets me. You hate the way the internet diminishes your actual true self. You love the way you can talk back to brands on Twitter and get responses. You hate the way you and your company get trolled on Twitter. You love the ability to search for anything. You hate Google having all your data. You love seeing pictures of your high school friend's kids on Facebook. You hate micro-targeted political ads you think might be sowing social division. You love giving Alexa voice commands and having your utilities automatically respond. You worry that she and other digital assistants might be spying on you. Now the truth is, these are not contradictions. These apparent inconsistencies reflect the eternal quest of human beings to be valued as individuals within the necessary constraints and equally necessary joys of living in families, communities, societies, and cultures. In other words, we all want to be treated like an I, but we all want you to remember that we are also a we. I am many we's. What our industry has not kept up with, what we failed to do in the 26 years since that first hotwired ad, and what we've got to do now is re-architect digital marketing to harmonize the three values that honestly, historically animated the Renaissance, the Reformation, the Enlightenment, and the advance of moder modernity. We've got to harmonize personalization, privacy, and community. Harmonizing personalization, privacy, and community is no small task. I'd argue it's even difficult to, to see it straight. Consider for a moment that personalization and privacy, these two superficially opposed values, are actually different perspectives on the same thing. Personalization is a third-party perspective on individuality. It can be a friend who mails a birthday card to my home. It could be Spotify, algorithmically offering me a package of tunes uh, tailored to preferences that it's gleaned from my expressed interests or my behaviors. 
The agency in personalization sits outside of me. It's done for me. Privacy is first person. It's my ownership of my individuality. I invite you into my home. But I don't want that other person intruding in my space without my invitation. It's OK. You can have my data, but only if I offer it to you and you give me something of value in return. Community, too, abounds with these competing perspectives. I love my family, my country, my football team, but not in the same way. Also, my tribe can be your enemy. Throughout history, these different perspectives on the I and the we have been rife with conflicts. Public education versus the right to homeschool. The social safety net versus onerous taxation. Vaccination for public health versus my bodily integrity. Gun rights versus community safety. Free speech versus hate speech. Give us your tired, your poor versus no Irish need apply. Overlay these various perspectives on the I and the we, and you can readily understand why the internet on some days looks like Jesus, Moses, Mohammed, and Buddha, while on other days it seems more like Michael Myers, Baba Duke, and Freddy Krueger. When it offers me value and gives me access to knowledge that would otherwise have been denied, the internet is divine. When it violates my dignity, intrudes uninvited into my domain, takes my data without recompense, and subordinates my community to other communities, it is evil. Now, of course, the internet is neither divine nor evil. It is us. It is imperfect. Like us, its makers and its masters, it can get better. It can listen more acutely, it can learn, it can adapt. It can stop unhealthy practices, and with exercise and a better diet, it can grow a healthier heart. That's a message I've been delivering from this stage almost every year since we began the IEB annual leadership meeting in 2008. How we together can grow a healthier, heartier internet. That indeed is the theme of this year's annual leadership meeting. The new alphabet of consumer experience, our theme, means to celebrate the new acronyms of our existence. AR, VR, OTT, 5G, IoT. The untold number of ways they unleash storytellers, creators, to appeal to the hearts and minds of human beings around the world. But as we saw last night, the new alphabet of consumer experience also means to shine a light on the darkness of the internet. Over the next two days, we'll look at the technologies that added relevance to digital media and marketing and ask why they've engendered such terrors about privacy. We'll explore the next generation of AI and ask how we can design a future that is less how and a little bit more R2-D2. As we did last night, we'll grapple with how we can rebuild our societies on a foundation of shared truths rather than on the shifting sands of disinformation. And most importantly, at this IEB annual leadership meeting, we will begin fixing these problems. We're at an inflection point. One month ago, Google announced a formal plan to phase out the use of third-party cookies in the Chrome browser. Google's move was two years in the making and followed more than six months of discussions with industry associations like the IEB and others. But Google has been far from alone here. Apple, Mozilla, and Microsoft have already made the transitions to cookie-rejecting browsers. And similar such moves have already begun and more forecast, especially on our ubiquitous mobile devices. Regulators and legislators across the globe are cracking down on digital media to assure consumer privacy is recognized as a right. The death of the third-party cookie has been bearing down on us like a freight train for years. How is it that we tethered the future of marketing and media to such a slight and imperfect technology? Hi, my name is Jordan Mitchell. 
Senior Vice President of Identity, Data, and Privacy at IAB Tech Lab, and I can help answer that question pretty simply. There was no other way. The internet and all the wonderful things that it's done for us as consumers was built on open standards. Cookies are an open standard, just like HTTP behind the web itself, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. For 26 years, cookies have been the only mechanism built in the browsers that allowed us to recognize consumers for any reason, for any purpose whatsoever, from the very first frequency cap capability in 1995 to literally all personalization on the web today and everything in between, including privacy settings. But as the business of the internet flourished and all these wonderful conveniences that we have as consumers flourished, the cookie didn't evolve to keep pace. Each and every website, ad server, platform, company, site owner has to create its own cookie, which has resulted in millions of cookies on the internet proliferating every single day. Third party cookies have enabled great things for us as consumers. They've enabled communities of interest to self-identify and to convene. But the cookies generated excessive tracking requests that have become the focal point of all of the anxieties and the data and privacy critiques that we see as an industry. If we're gonna satisfy consumers, the IEB, IEB Tech Lab, our sister and brother organizations and other non-governmental organizations will have to invent a new future that harmonizes privacy, personalization, and community. Thank you, Jordan. From a business standpoint, the crackdown on cookies could not be occurring at a worse time. For as strong as the US economic recovery seems, it remains fragile, and the robust GDP figures mask years of underperformance by mainstream brands and retailers across virtually all categories of consumer goods. As you will learn later today when we unveil the 2020 IEB Brand Disruption Report, in 2019, brick and mortar store closings increased in the United States by 68% to a record high 9,300 stores that shuttered. Those sales are shifting inexorably to data-driven e-commerce, which is growing at five times the rate of total retail. In most major consumer products categories, all growth is taking place in e-tail. Food sales are up one-tenth of a percentage point in physical stores, up 60% in digital stores. Household care goods are up six-tenths of a percent in brick and mortar, up 32% in e-tail. Now, whether you use a benign word like relevance or a scary word like tracking, internet personalization is the engine of this economic transformation. In our new policy track this afternoon, we will be releasing new econometric research by John Dayton. John's the Harold M. Brearley Professor of Business Administration Emeritus at the Harvard Business School. In his study, he concludes, and I quote, if tracking were to end, the advertising revenue earned by the open web by 2025 would decline between $32 billion and $39 billion, with more than 90% of those revenues shifting from publishers to walled gardens. The world's greatest brands, retailers, and publishers understand the value of personalization. They know that relationships realized through continuously replenished data are now the core asset of their enterprise, of every enterprise. This is the reason more than 100 brands, giants and disruptors alike, have joined IAB in the past year, since we changed our rules to welcome brands into our membership. Like our 650 publisher, platform, and technology members, these brands know that relationships matter. Yet this new requirement for brands to own human relationships at scale through digital media and device interactions is running headlong into the desire of humans to safeguard their online identity. And that dilemma is manifesting itself in the current privacy debate. How can these values be reconciled? Hey everyone, it's great to be here. My name is David Spector. I'm the co-founder, co-CEO of Third Love and a new member of the IAB Board of Directors. We're a seven-year-old direct-to-consumer bra and underwear brand for women of all sizes, shapes, and shades. And I can illuminate a little bit on the dilemma that brands are facing. Third Love started with a big idea. 
women who had suffered for years wearing lo lousy bras and undergarments deserve better. They deserve undergarments meant for them, designed to fit perfectly, based on millions of real women's sizes and not size templates. My wife and co-founder, co-CEO, Heidi Zach, at Heidi on Instagram, if anybody wants to check her out, created a service and infrastructure for our customers so we could give continual feedback and build community so they could talk to each other. Our ability to interact directly with our customers and connect them to our brand and connect them to each other has been central to our growth. And I'm proud to say that we are now, according to NPD, the third largest online women's underwear brand behind Victoria's Secret and Aerie. But in order to keep growing, we need to be able to find new customers and keep existing ones, identify their needs, help them with their fit and style issues, and connect them to each other and to us. We need, and in fact our customers demand, a personalized experience based on her unique needs and her unique sizing profile. We deeply respect our customers' privacy, but they are also the ones craving the personalization that we bring them. We, along with so many other online businesses, absolutely need the IAB, the Tech Lab, and other industry organizations to harmonize per privacy, personalization, and community. It is vital to our success, and it's vital to all the other small businesses and brands out there, and the countless aspiring entrepreneurs who haven't even started yet. Thank you, Dave. Publishers, too, face the same challenges and the same opportunities. Human time spent consuming media was up 21 minutes a day from 2018 to 2019. But every one of those new minutes, every one, is in an on-demand, direct, personalizable channel or medium. In 2019, according to Nielsen, time spent with linear television declined by 17 minutes a day, while time spent with mobile devices increased by 42 minutes a day. This trend hasn't been lost on publishers, not in the least. The world's largest video companies are rapidly building out direct-to-consumer brands. And there's no doubt that viewers want them. In November, Walt Disney Company launched Disney+. Plus. The most optimistic analysts projected Disney would snare 20 million customers through all of 2020. Disney Plus signed up 28 million subscribers in its first three months. But how will these new channels satisfy their consumers if they are constrained in exploring, analyzing, and responding to their behaviors? How will they find new consumers efficiently if they cannot look at their behaviors in their marketing planning? Hi, I'm Alicia Borsa. I'm the Chief Business and Data Officer at Meredith. I'm a new member of the IAB Board of Directors, and I have an answer to this question. Meredith has over 40 powerful brands, People, Entertainment Weekly, Real Simple, In Style, Travel and Leisure, and the list goes on. Our brands engage and bring stories to life for our 180 million plus consumers, and more importantly, engaging 90% of all US women each month. And the heart of our relationship with her is trust. They trust that the celebrity news on people is real and not internet rumors, or the recipes on all recipes we can all do, the largest UGC social network for food, uh, and the recommendations from InStyle. But that also means they trust and expect that the advertising on our brands is relevant and provides value. Ultimately, our success depends on our ability to deeply, deeply understand our consumers, predict trends and their intent. So we need a trustworthy supply chain to leverage all of that knowledge and our first party data to optimize and personalize our content, our offers and our advertising. And today our consumers trust us with their data and they trust that they're going to keep it safe, that we're gonna keep it safe. To realize all of this potential and do right by our consumers, our collective consumers, we need to come together as an industry. We need organizations like the IAB and the IAB Tech Lab and others to help us harmonize personalization, privacy, and community. Thank you, Alicia. As if re-architecting digital marketing to re-establish trust relationships isn't enough, we have essential business relationships that are going to need to be re-engineered. Let's agree, let's stipulate 
that third-party cookies were, no, are imperfect. But for all their flaws and warts, they've been central to the way advertising works in digital environments, as Jordan indicated. And therefore, they've been central to the creation of the entire internet economy. In 2018, as that chart says, internet advertising spend passed $100 billion for the first time in history. That represents a year-on-year -year increase of almost 22%, far more than any other medium. Why? Well, you know the answer. Because advertisers are following the eyeballs, and they're following the voice commands, and they're following the social interactions that define digital media. But the processes and systems by which they have followed and benefit have been built on the foundation of third-party cookies. How will the business ecosystem adapt to their elimination? Let me help you with that. Uh, I am Steve Cattleman. I am the executive vice president of global digital partnerships at Omnicom Media Group. It's the media buying arm for a very large holding company. So the dilemma, let, let me help you with the dilemma that we face. Obviously, I'm not a fan of the third party cookie. There's pros and cons as, as you've illuminated before. But we still use them for media planning. We use them to track audience sizes. We use them for uh, measurement of behaviors and interactions. Uh, we use them for attribution. The, the, the one thing that I think this is all coming down to is it's, it's almost like a blessing in disguise. We've, we have some time to think about what that solution is. And, and re-architecting it for the future, I think, is, is going to be a good thing. Like, whatever's beyond the cookie could be a benefit for everybody in this room. What I think that we're losing sight on and what the main problem is, is the education of the consumer. Like, we put up, hey, like, for the last year, you've seen the sites that all have pop-ups that say, we use cookies, and I think that's confusing people more than ever. And I think what we need to focus on is whatever that solution is, and we have some, you know, whether it's a login, email address, or, or whatever, we need to make sure that the, the real consumer understands that quid pro quo, the value exchange of you are getting, you are getting content in exchange for this advertising. So again, I, I think we all need to work together. It's like the harmonizing seems to be the key word here. Not just the IEB and the tech lab, but bring in the ANA and the four A's and really work together because the clock is ticking. And you know, n now is the time. And, and I honestly think a year from now or two years from now, we all come together and say, this, this, was, this was actually a good thing. And, and you know, we, we can move on from it and be very proud of the industry we work in. Thanks, Steve. That's a good segue to what I want to say next. I learned an interesting word this year. The word is collab. I learned it at VidCon, which is the giant video creators conference, when I was doing a fireside chat with uh, Rosanna Pansino. I'm sure there are some Rosanna Pansino fans in the room. She's a four foot 10 inch baker, actress, singer, and YouTube creator with 11.8 million followers and nearly 3 billion total views. So in our chat, she kept talking about uh, a collab that she did with another creator. She mentioned how she and several creators spent several weeks living in a collab house. I nodded. I did a lot of nodding. This is like what I do in tech lab board meetings. And then I looked up the meeting. The meeting. A collab can be a noun, a collaboration. A collab can be a verb, to collaborate with someone. But mostly, a collab is a state of being. It's how you act with others. Now, this made me a bit comfortable, because IEB knows how to collab. In fact, IEB is a giant collab. And everything we do is a collab. The Digital Advertising Alliance is your ad choices program. Now, you all know that. That's the mechanism that places the forward eye icon on more than a tri trillion digital ad impressions a year. And more than 100 million consumers have clicked on it to learn how to safeguard and how to make choices about managing their data. That was a collab among the ANA, the 4As, the DMA, the NAI, and the IEB. Other collabs with our partner associations yielded groundbreaking breaking industry agreements on viewability. Also led to the creation of the anti-fraud program, TAG which has reduced digital ad fraud by 88% in its certified channels. 
An even larger current collab is the Global Alliance for Responsible Media. GARM was organized by the World Federation of Advertisers. It's led by 56 percent, 56 of the world's largest brands, agencies, publishers, platforms, and technology companies. It recently announced a groundbreaking agreement to eliminate harmful content from ad-supported media by adopting shared definitions, common tools and systems, and independent oversight to block, demonetize, and take down harmful content. Another very successful recent collab was organized by the IAB. It involved 300 legal, technical, and policy experts at 170 IAB member companies to develop the IAB CCPA compliance solution. That solution has now been adopted by 201 companies to comply with California's new privacy law. Fact, if I can digress a little bit, these collabs help answer the question all your CFOs ask when the IAB dues bills come in toward the end of the year. What kind of value are we getting for this, this, these dues? Let's do the math. TAG saves U.S. companies 88% of the $8.2 billion that E&Y says is lost to ad fraud each year. TAG also cut in half $2.8 billion in ad flows to content pirate sites, protecting trademark content for publishers. IAB initiatives, including the Tech Lab VAST standards and the digital content new fronts, underpin the $16 billion U.S. digital video industry. Tech Lab standards and the podcast upfronts similarly are foundational to the $2 billion podcast industry, an industry that was worth really just a couple million dollars when we started these things. IAB's CCPA compliance solution will help participants circumvent $55 billion in the compliance costs the California Attorney General estimates it's going to cost them. Add that, add to that the $32 billion to $39 billion we'll save by re-architecting the cookie-based ad ecosystem. So how much is IAB membership worth to you? Conservatively, collectively, between $113 and $121 billion and counting. Take that to your CFO. Thank you. But that's chump change compared with the value yet to be created. When I gave my first talk at the IAB ALM in 2008, U.S. digital advertising revenues were about $5 billion a year. As you saw in the chart before, they're now more than $100 billion and still growing. The corresponding societal benefits of that spend have been an order of magnitude greater than that. As channels converge, as 5G makes real-life multimedia, as all advertising becomes human-centered, society has the opportunity to again reap corresponding exponential benefits. But if we do nothing, the gains will reverse. There'll be fragmentation in laws and technology, and there will be concentration that stifles innovation and squeezes out all the small players. But that trend is not destiny. We can create that new value. But in order to do so, we have to collab again. And we've got to do it in an even bigger way than we've ever tried before. So how are we going to accomplish this? Good morning. I'm Dennis Bakheim, president of IAB Tech Lab. I'm going to start to answer that question. Tech Lab was founded by the IAB about five years ago as an independent, global, cross-industry, standard-setting body. We're set, we set the standards for digital marketing and media, and including many of the most important standards that our industry is based on, such as ads.txt for fighting fraud, and OpenRTB, and all of the programmatic standards associated with it. As we've evolved, we've learned something crucial to successful standardization efforts. Technology and practice must be joined at the hip. Brand safety is not an abstract problem. Marketing, sales, and business leaders, and not just product leaders and engineering leaders, must be involved from the start and must integrate technology into their understanding. Same with measurement, same with data and privacy, same with brands in-housing their programmatic stacks or publishers reorganizing to align direct and programmatic sales. If we were to re-architect digital marketing, 
we must appeal to the senior leadership across all major brands, retailers, ad agencies, publishers, the rest of the digital media stack, ad tech and martech infrastructure, and the platforms, and we must show them that harmonizing personalization, privacy, and community is not just a technical requirement, but is in fact a business requirement that is critical to their futures. Thank you, Dennis. Whatever cross-industry collaboration we engineer, it will require separate work streams for business model adaptation, public policy, technical architecture, strategic communications, probably more. Engaging the entire marketing and media industry in this endeavor won't be easy, especially because we've got to engage bitter rivals in the same rooms, especially because this cannot be a US exercise alone, but needs at the least transparency to companies, citizens, and governments around the world. And here's what makes it even more complicated, thing that people rarely talk about, the elephant in the room. We've got to get people in their own companies talking to each other across the functional silos that are rigidly isolated from each other today. We need sales leaders talking to engineers. We need CMOs talking to product developers. We need publishers talking to ad tech intermediaries. We need lawyers talking to retailers. We need chief procurement officers talking to chief privacy officers. And we've got to do more than talk. We have to listen. We have to negotiate. We have to simplify. And we must execute. For here's the simple truth. Our industries, all of us together, have disrupted the equilibrium of a century-old marketing media ecosystem. Big parts of that disruption are fantastic. People have more access to more information about more things than ever in the history of mankind. It's easier to build a business today than at any time in history. But we have also created a messy and frightening marketplace built on the collection and use of personal information that scares the daylights out of a lot of people because they do not understand it and they cannot control it. We've built it in a way that requires a doctorate in engineering to understand. Governments have rightly stepped in to attempt to offer fixes, but their laws also are difficult to comprehend by consumers and businesses alike. People are asked for rounds and rounds of consent and still don't understand what they're agreeing to. And so the spiral of mistrust continues. The coming death of the third party cookie allows us to fix all of that. It is an opportunity to change the economics of personal data so it and its outcomes favor consumers. We have the chance to create a new industry and a new world in which privacy by design is as well understood, as fairly applied, and as universally beneficial as safety by design has been for decades in the automotive industry and the food industry. Right now, the movement to harmonize personalization, privacy, and community is being led by two different forces that cannot succeed on their own. Internet browser companies and giant device companies are working assiduously to develop consumer privacy solutions. Most of them are well-meaning, but they are driven as much by their competition with each other as they are by consumer centricity. Their competition will result in an internet with radically different privacy and personalization regimes. It will be far too expensive and complex for citizens or companies to work with. Then there are governments. With their regulatory authority, they can force a level playing field that allows competition to flourish as consumer protection is enhanced. But governmental authority is limited by geographical boundaries, whereas browsers and devices are multinational in their dispersion. And government bureaucracy too frequently leads, as I just mentioned, to incomprehensibly dense regulations that only the largest corporations can afford to comply with. As marketing and media professionals, we cannot abdicate our responsibility or our future to a multinational tech oligopoly or multiple government bureaucracies. We must take collective ownership. We must take agency. So let the movement to re-architect digital marketing, to harmonize personalization, privacy, and community begin today, 
right here at the IEB annual leadership meeting. I've talked to our sister associations, the ANA and the 4As, with whom we have toiled so hard and so successfully on so many important initiatives. They have indicated their desire to work together again and are committed to defining the post-cookie world and preserving all that is good about our industry. So let's build on the work we've done together. Let's build on the work of DAA and CBA and TAG and GARM and our other collabs. And let's be bold. The challenge demands it. Let's call this new effort Project REARC. REARC has a deliberate double meaning. It means we're going to dig in together literally to re-architect how digital marketing works. So the three values of privacy, personalization, and community can work together. It also means we're going to change the trajectory, the arc of digital media and marketing to put consumers in the safe, sane, and exciting center of everything we do. Together, we will reconstitute how privacy, personalization, and community can blend together to create vast new consumer benefits. Together, we will collaborate to create standards of behavior, codes of conduct, legal agreements, enabling technologies, and supporting regulations to assure that the values of personalization, privacy, and community can be meshed. Today, I want to start by asking you all to message me the one thing you believe we need to accomplish as an industry to reimagine our advertising and marketing future in a post-cookie, heightened privacy, ever more personalized media environment. The address to email is on the screen. Here's the deal. You don't have to be civic. Be as self-serving as you want to be. Think about your company. Think about yourself as well. Tell us what you need. Be as specific as possible. We want your ideas to help frame, shape, and direct Project REARC. We're going to share these ideas, collect them, share them with everyone in this room, and share them with the entire industry. Now, there's more. Whether you're a brand, agency, platform, publisher, or technology provider, I'll give you five more ideas about how you can work with Project REARC, starting right here, right now. First, assign your chief data officer or the equivalent to the IEB data center, and soon to Project REARC's work stream on data. If you don't have a chief data officer, for God's sake, hire one. Second, get your CTO or your chief product officer or both into the tech lab and make sure your teams are assigned to the various work streams that tech lab is already engaged in to re-architect the digital advertising supply chain. Third, commit to implementing the best practices and technical standards that emerge from product REARC. Brands and agencies, this is especially meant for you because you're the money and money talks and if you're not talking, no one else needs to listen. Fourth, build the best practices and standards into your procurement processes and contracts. In the world of business, that is the only way change happens. You should all refuse to do business with companies whose practices are not safe and are not consumer friendly. Thank you. And fifth, we have a bunch of CEOs in this room. This isn't for you. If you're not the CEO, then ladder Project REARC up to your CEO. I said it before. I'm going to say it until they cart me out in a box. Relationships realized through continuously replenished data are now the core asset of every enterprise on Earth. And if your chief executive officer is not paying attention, she should. Today and tomorrow at the IB ALM, I urge all of you, all of us, to roll up our sleeves to participate in the numerous tech lab and IB sessions at which some of the technical and policy underpinnings of Project REARC will launch. Over the next several weeks, we anticipate a more formal announcement of industry partnerships to commence the other work streams. The time has come. Thank God the third party cookie will soon be dead. 
Let's get on to what is next. Let the re-architected, harmonized, privacy, safe, personalized, community-based digital marketing industry begin right here and right now. Thank you very much.